Hey, Julie, if you can hear me, um, we're just going to hang out here for a second. And there we go. We're all live. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum. And welcome to our session this afternoon. We have a really great program for you today. Uh, today, I'm going to have this wonderful chat with Julia Badger, who works for NASA in robotics. You know, we can go through the whole title thing and all that sort of thing. Autonomous Systems Technology Discipline Lead at uh, National Air and Space Muse National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, and I think she's at Johnson Space Center, but let's introduce her here now and we'll get all that stuff. Let's say hi to Julia Badger. Hi, Julia. Hi, Derek. Nice to be here with you. Yeah, thanks for joining us this afternoon. You know, there's so many different ways we can characterize what you do at NASA, and we're going to get into that because it really is deep and exciting when you look at everything, particularly about the future of where you're going with this. But first, why don't you tell us what your title is at NASA? We'll go from there. Well, I have a couple of titles. You, you gave one of them. Um, right now, what I am working on is the Gateway Program. I am the Gateway Vehicle Systems Manager systems manager. So what that means is that we've got a system on board that is looking at the vehicle from a holistic standpoint. We're building it kind of like we built the International Space Station. There's modules coming from all over the place, all over the globe. Um, the vehicle systems manager is essentially the control system that looks at all of those different modules coming together and says, hey, what are we, what are we doing as a vehicle? My role is the systems manager for that. So I'm the one that's make sh making sure that we build it and it does what it needs to do and it, and it integrates our gateway in the right way. Very cool. But, but wait a minute, let's just rewind a little bit here because you said the gateway program and a bunch of other things about spacecraft and let's just start from the beginning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what gateway is and then we can build up into what you're doing exactly from there. Okay, well, I'm actually going to take it back a step further, if you don't mind, and talk about what Artemis is. Because hey, um, Gateway is a great. <laughs> the gateway is a really important part of, of Artemis. So um, our president and vice president a few years back challenged us to say, can we put people on the moon, and specifically the next American man and first American woman on the moon by 2024 and do so in a sustainable manner? So we're changing it up for what we did from Apollo. What we're wanting to do is establish a base, um, particularly at the southern pole of the moon, because that seems to be an important part from a geology standpoint. There's a lot of cool stuff that's happening there. How we're going to do that is, um, using technology that we've been developing for many years, including stuff that we're learning from the ISS. We have this uh, new rocket that's going to be incorporated into the Artemis program called the SLS, the Space uh, Launch System, um, and then Orion or uh, the, the multi-purpose crew vehicle um, is, is going to be bringing folks, bringing our astronauts out to the moon area. The sustainability part um, basically is is Gateway. So Gateway is meant to be a platform. Um, it's kind of where the ISS astronauts go for their rustic space camping experience. So it's going to be a much smaller space station than what we have on orbiting the Earth. But it's meant to orbit the moon and be kind of that launch pad to um, get to that. And then you can switch and get logistics and whatever else. So it, it kind of changes our delta V equation. It makes it a little bit cheaper. Um, and then you can go from our Gateway that down to the moon, or maybe even as we move further into our space exploration onto Mars. And so the, the graphic I'm showing up here is kind of the overall kind of what you want to see. And it's got the Earth on one side and Mars on the other side. So it's, it's really meant to kind of uh, run that gamut. And Gateway is our, our platform for doing that exploration and sustainability um, research that we need to, to make this all happen. Cool, that sounds great. So this is all part of uh, building the entire project of our next, our next, our next visits to the moon. And uh, Gateway there then is this intermediate step or station after astronauts leave the moon International Space Station, I'm sorry, leave Earth and International Space Station on the way to the moon. They'll stop here first before they head down. How close to the moon will Gateway be? That's an interesting question. So we're going to be in something called a near rectilinear orbit, which means it's very elliptical. It's very 
drawn out. Sometimes we'll be very close to the moon within several kilometers. And then sometimes we're going to be way far away from the moon when it's um, down at that kind of that lower edge. What it's meant to do is be able to give us a good um, viewpoint, um, good calm reach, both visibility to the Earth and to that southern pole of the moon, so that when astronauts are down there, we're basically that good calm link that we can get our, our data and communications. We really want to have that nice shot of uh, the first American woman and next American man on the moon and get that, you know, HD TV through our, through our gateway is, it's just one of the reasons obviously for it, but uh, it does help a lot to have that, that satellite there to help that out. So Julia, about how big is gateway going to pr propose to be? Um, it's not very big. So from the standpoint of the ISS, um, they, you know, it's the football field long and it's like a five bedroom house and, and that sort of thing. Um, we're thinking it's gonna be a bit more than a studio apartment, but not a lot, you know, maybe a two bedroom apartment kind of feel once it's fully developed. Um, but we are kind of phasing our approaches. When we first send astronauts, they are very similar to the ISS. It's going to be very small, just one habitation um, module called HALO that Northrop Grumman is providing. Cool, and how long will astronauts hang out there before they either head down to the moon or head back up to International Space Station? So we're expecting to have about four astronauts come, two will stay, and two will go to the moon. The mission length varies depending on where we are in our program, but as we start out, we're thinking it's around 30 days. It might be slightly less depending on some of the constraints, but around 30 days, um, and I'm not sure how long they stay before they go down to the moon, but I think it's on the order of four to six days, and then they'll go to the moon and then come back okay. and then launch back home from Gateway. Okay, and then the last sort of piece about this is once they get to the moon, how long is the Artemis mission proposing that astronauts be down on the surface there? So that's about three weeks when it comes down to, to it. Um, I think we are expecting as part of our sustainability effort to increase the time that we spend on the moon. I'm not sure we'll ever get to a human, uh, you know, a, a permanent human presence on the moon like we do on ISS, but the idea is to test out what we need when we go to Mars, and we're going to be stuck on Mars for you know anywhere up to maybe 500 days before we have an opportunity to launch back. So we really have to think about how long do we need to stay on the moon to do the, the right types of development and research to get to the answers we need for Mars. Okay, great. That sounds cool. So now we have this whole picture built out now of the Artemis program, including Gateway, uh, and it, all sounds really exciting that you know, we're headed back to the moon. And uh, about, about when do you think this might happen? Well, we are. We have been told that we need to land people on the moon by 2024. They won't go to Gateway first necessarily, but Gateway is planned right now to be launched at the end of 2023, which sounds really far away to you, but really close to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how they say, uh, "Be careful." Objects on the calendar, you know, look really close. Uh, look <laughs> far away, but they're really much closer than they appear. <laughs> exactly. Now, now the Artemis program overall and Gateway to some degree. I mean, are, are these programs ex expe expected to be sort of like, like national programs? Are they going to have an international component to them? I understand that maybe there could be some international partners that participate in the Gateway project. Great question. Yes, it's going to be a lot like the ISS. In fact, we're engaging all of our ISS partners in different aspects of the gateway. Um, as it stands right now, we have um, several contributions from the European Space Agency as part modules and parts of, of uh, the uh, the gateway as it as it moves beyond this initial phase. Um, they are going to have a, like a refueling module and a, a big contribution is the main habitat, the international habitat will be um, their contribution. Canada is going to, the CSA is going to provide an, another, um, it's actually kind of a set of robotic um, external robotic um, manipulators. We are trying to move to getting all of this maintenance done without people being there and no um, spacewalks if we can. Um, that just adds to um, the, the, the 
workload that they have in the short time that they're there. And so they're, they're going to be very important pieces. Um, and then our Japanese space agency is, um, I think, contributing um, components of the life support system to the international habitat amongst other um, smaller kind of system level um, uh, things. Roscosmos isn't um, fully involved yet, but we're even expecting them to to get involved as we move forward as well. They've they've definitely been uh, interested in the discussions, and so we welcome their help as well. And they've been uh, long term partners with us from, from the yeah. beginning for International Space Station. So it would make sense that we take advantage of uh, their knowledge and experience as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So so now. Um, Let's sort of blend this now with your expertise in uh, systems engineering, of course, systems management, but also in robotics. Tell me, how much of a role does robotics play in the gateway system? So this is a really exciting time to be a roboticist and a space nerd because we're finally getting where we have like robots roaming around by themselves on board our spacecraft yes absolutely so um we have a spacecraft that's going to be uninhabited and it's going to be a crew vessel where it's got a pressure system and life support and a lot of complexity it's not like the probes we send to, to pluto which you have fewer systems involved, right? This is a thing that can sustain life. And it's going to be uninhabited for up to 11 months of the year. So we need to make sure that we've got something that's able to do the maintenance and protect it. Um, as you know, as all of us know, if you leave your house alone for you know like two weeks, you come back, something's funky and broken and whatever else. That's what happens in space too. Um, so things we expect things to, to go wrong and to break. Um, robots are going to be there to help us take care of a lot of different things. Some of it just being inspection, being able to go look behind a panel and see what's there. Uh, if there's not somebody there and you don't want to put cameras all over the place because those cost money, they cost mass, they cost electricity, they cost data processing and storage. Um, you can maybe have a mobile camera that is you know, on a robot that can then go and, and look in the places that you, that you might not have. They're expected to do logistics. We're going to get um, flights like SpaceX is going to be um, delivering logistics to, to the gateway, um, including materials for that will go down onto the moon uh, with, with uh, the human landing system and our astronauts. And so when we get those logistics, there may be payloads or, or what have you that we need to pull out and install other places or or are maintained, our robots will be involved in, in doing that. And finally, maintenance. Like I said, you know, things that, that could, if you could, you know, turn a crank, push a button, change a filter really is more kind of on the level. Um, that's the type of things that we would really like to make sure we have the ability to do, both inside and outside. So I think we've had, you know, the Canada arm and our last two major spacecraft um, and helped out quite a bit. We're now looking at having that sort of idea inside as well. So it will be um, an intravehicular robot, an IVR, we like to call it as well. Um, Beyond the robots, of course, is the just the smarts of the system and making the spacecraft itself kind of a robot. And that's the, the vehicle system manager or the VSM, which is that higher level thinking of I've got stuff to do, how do I do it? How do I get from one state of my system to the next state and the autonomy essentially that you need to do to be able to do that? You know, that was my next question. Um, I know <laughs> that, uh, that you've said in the past, Julia, that uh, a lot of your interest in robotics was sparked by Isaac Asimov's book, I, Robot. And, uh, when you mentioned autonomy, I was actually thinking of asking you about the degree of autonomy that these robots would have, and if there are any models that are currently in use that you know that you're using to base you know base these newer models off of. And if we talk about uh, about autonomy, where's that sort of interface happen between the robot being on its own and then having human sort of like intervention either for direct control and operation or for uploading commands or any of those sorts of things absolutely that's a great question nice research by the way <laughs> so we have been um, uh, uh working for many years on this um i 
used to lead a project called Robonaut. Um, and Robonaut is, it's an upper body humanoid with really creepy looking legs that are really manipulators that help it to, to walk around. It spent a, a good amount of time on the International Space Station itself. But a lot of the work that we did on Robonaut um, on the ground is really to think about how do we break the link between humans joysticking or teleoperating, uh, teleoperating a robot? Because as we move to a gateway where we may only have human operators looking at the gateway up to eight hours per week, which contrasts with ISS where we've got people 24 seven, at least eight positions filled 24 seven um, to take care of that, that uh, spacecraft. A robot just won't have that much human interaction. It needs to be able to, to go and do some tasks on its own. And so obviously humans are going to be involved. They're going to be helped plan what's going on, it's, they're going to shape the manipulations it's going to do, all of those sorts of things. But we're moving much toward more towards a supervisory and even kind of an autonomous slash supervisory type of mode where the robot will go and do its thing and make that, that task happen, have some ability to um, reason about the success of what it has done and try other strategies. Um, so we've, we've demonstrated this with Robonaut. We have something called the task force and the affordance templates frameworks that we've merged together to basically give the robot um, tasks of manipulation and mobility that, that have different strategies that can try to, to do things. And then have human operators come in and support when necessary or kind of periodically to, to make sure that task was completed and, and to get that done. So we're working very hard on that. One more robot, just to back up, because you asked about the different test beds that are going on, um, that we have on the ISS is also um, something called Astrobee. Um, this is a robot that the Ames Research Center has developed and flown on the ISS. It's like a little ball that flies through. So if you think Star Wars, yeah. You know, they've kind of got it there. It's, it's kind of cool. So we're, we're, um, Does that really exist? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty neat. And so they can put different payloads, um, different sensors on it. Um, it doesn't do a lot of affecting because it's flying through the air. It doesn't have a lot of uh, ability to, to provide torque, right? But it's a great mobile sensor platform. And in fact, we've done some work on partnering Astrobe and Robonaut to like have Astrobe be in kind of the fast scout to figure out what's going on and then have Robonaut be, okay, I can go and now move this thing because I know that it's here. So it's a, it's a, that concept right there is how we're basing our robot, our intravehicular robot design for Gateway. Okay, so now I have to ask you, which came first, the Star Wars version or the NASA version? The Star Wars version came first, but there were several other NASA versions that came before Astrobe. We had Sprint and AirCam Sprint, and so we've been we've been trying to achieve, you know, how life imitates art, imitates life. You know, that we've been uh, trying to achieve that balance for many years. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a really uh, it's a really cool thing though to uh, see these technologies that NASA has created. You know, uh, either regardless of which one came first, to sort of see them going across the boundary between. Uh, fantasy and reality, you know. It's, uh, yeah, it's really cool to see that. If uh, if any of our viewers uh, haven't had a chance to see this robot, you really got to check this thing out. It is miraculous, and I, I guess one of the thing, cool things for me, Julia, is that it sort of marries uh, the microgravity environment with the uh, with this interesting mobility capability uh, that you couldn't really do easily in a standard one G environment. So uh, it sort of helps you grasp what that environment is like a little bit. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, well, um, I'm sure robotics is, is going to play a, a, a huge role going forward. I mean, the, all that you're saying, you know, indicates how important it is for uh, to have these, these robots um, to do all these things that need to be done in an environment that is going to be uninhabited by humans for such a long time. Uh, that upkeep and maintenance is, is truly important. Do you see robotics? as uh, uh, continuing to play a, a, a big role going forward, even out to uh, our arrival at Mars? Absolutely. So um, there's, uh, my, my, my grand boss likes to say this, and I think it's a really good thing that to, to talk about, but 
when you climb Mount Everest, you don't just, you know, ex like bring everything with you or anything that the first people did, right? But now they're Sherpas, right? And they, they bring stuff for you and it's kind of set up. There's a base camp and then there's a camp further up and et cetera and forth, so forth. We're doing that with Gateway, right? So Gateway is kind of that, that one base camp, if you will, before you go down to the moon and then you'll have, you know, supplies on the moon. And then once we kind of do that, we'll start launching things out to Mars. And those things are going to be there and they're not going to be touched by humans until humans get there, but they need to work, right? So we may launch a habitat. We may launch a, um, something that drives it along and we, we may launch all of the, the supplies, all of the food. And we need to make sure that those things are healthy and maintained and robots are going to be a huge part of that. So we expect that, you know, as further out, we, uh, the further out we go, the more need for robotics to be our, our housekeepers, our, our maintenance bots, all of those types of things, our Sherpas, if you will, you mm -hmm. know, they're going to be the ones that are going to take care of our logistics as we move forward. And, and one more point in that is that, you know, how you win wars is logistics, right? Is, is getting the stuff and the people to the right places. And yeah. this is kind of like that too, you know, how are we going to achieve this? We really have to have a logistics mindset and the logistics are going to need maintenance and, and robots are going to be the things to do it. Um, Julia, can we, is it possible to uh, attach some uh, value to, um, how do we say, um, risk avoidance by using robots in place of human explorers in certain instances? I mean, I get the whole thing about, you know, it's important for humans to be the explorers. I'm totally down with that. Uh, but there's also a value in, in having robot, robotics able to take on some of that risk as well. Is that true? Well, there's definitely places where robots make more sense than sending humans. But I think that if there's an ability to send a human, you want that. Um, there's There's been robots on Mars for a long time. And the geologists who work on those robots, who love those robots, right? They are, they're married to these robots. They will even tell you that the you know, amount of work that that robot does in a year, that that person plus their two grad students could do it in like half a day, mm. right? Because there's just that difference in human intellect that we don't have in, computer, in computers and robots. And having worked on computers and robots, I don't see it having <laughs> that intelligence in my lifetime, maybe beyond, but you know, right. it's, it's very hard to really capture that. Even artificial intelligence isn't really intelligence, it's making connections between data that that's there, whereas in a human sense, you've got the sensors that are, you just, the, the, the development of our sensors and the and intricacies and how that data gets into our brains and we're able to make those connections isn't something that we've achieved yet. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. So humans are still really important to, to be in situ as much as possible. That's a really great point. Thank you very much for bringing that out. You know. Uh, you know, we don't we don't have to spend the time here talking about uh, you know how how people have different opinions about human space exploration, but I think you have a really good point there, especially in helping people understand uh, the level to which uh, artificial intelligence has pushed so far. I mean, you're deep in this and you really understand it. And for you to say that you don't see it happening in your lifetime, uh, I think that's a really important and uh, valuable piece of information for people to sort of take in. Uh, along those same lines of, of humans being involved in this, so overall, just generally speaking, tell us a little bit about why you think deep space exploration is, is so important. There's a lot of things that I think deep space exploration is going to tell us. We are really, um, we're still even learning about our own planet, but I think there's uh, you get to a point where you've answered the questions that you think you have on your planet, but you don't know that there are other questions unless you see something else sometimes. So it's like almost when you read a new book, it makes you think about the previous book differently because now you've got a new basis for reality or a basis for your questions, basis for your imagination to go from. Um, and, and that's what we essentially will be doing with deep, deep space exploration. So I was fortunate enough when I was at Caltech to get a minor in planetary science and I absolutely loved it because it really opened up like the idea of like, what is the science that these people are doing? Like, how are they doing this? And 
So we had this great class on satellite imagery, you know, and like, you know, telescopes like Hubble or whatever, looking really closely at these, these stars and uh, these planets and what they were able to kind of tell. And so you were looking at it and you're saying, okay, well, what, what's the formation here? And so what they did was they had us look at pictures that our earth satellites took of places in California. And they were like, what do you think this is? And so we would draw and we would come up with all of this stuff and it was great. And then we went to take a field trip there. And so we literally went out to this, you know, volcano field and found that our, I mean, we sometimes got things right, but it was really hard to really understand what was going on when you were like on the ground and be able to tell that from where you are above. And so us looking at Mars and us looking at these other moons and planets is good. It helps us a little bit, but you know, actually going and exploring is going to really push where we understand creation of our solar system, our universe maybe even. And then from a technology standpoint, which I kind of care about more, but it's fine. Both things are important. Is it's gonna help us learn how to live better on Earth by understanding how we would live on the moon and Mars. So if you have a closed system, because it's hard to get stuff and you need air and food and water, and it's not necessarily right there where you have to do something to get it, you're gonna learn a lot more about how you sustain your life here and understand how we can be resource limited here and have a closed system, if you will, here, protect our Earth by going and advancing this technology in this way. Um, do you have to do it on Mars? It's a lot more fun. You learn a lot more, and I think it's a lot more challenging. Um, so no, you don't maybe, but it, I think it, it absolutely gives you that different perspective that you might need. Okay, now um, you're a mechanical engineer from Purdue. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you've taken planetary geology, right? Yes. Your opportunity comes to go to Mars. Are you going? <laughs> Well, you know, I have three kids and a husband, and if they could go too, then maybe. But <laughs> I actually kind of like this this ground based uh, version where I make these other people go. There's a lot of people who sign up. <laughs> you know, I had to ask, right? With all that background, yeah. I had to ask. Oh, I very much yeah. wanted to be an astronaut when I was earlier, but then I decided that this side was, was cooler. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Good for you. So, you know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, innovation that happens at NASA and in the Artemis program, you know, there's going to be more and more and more innovation happening in order to reach these goals by, you know, these stated time periods of 2023, as you said, for Gateway 2024 uh, to mm -hmm. actually get people out to the moon and so on and so forth like that. I mean, is there some, is there one favorite thing that, that, that you see at NASA in all of this innovation that really grabs your attention? I mean, I know you're working on all this stuff right now, but you know, is there anything else? Oh goodness, that's a loaded question. So my favorite thing is obvious because I have a bias towards this autonomy and these control systems. And so right. the I'll start there, but I'll go, I'll I'll branch out for you too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but um just from a, the autonomy standpoint, kind of what we're doing is trying to understand how you would have a more hands-off and reactive and, and smart way of dealing with things that can dynamically happen and resources and, and that sort of thing that apply to situations on Earth that maybe you, you wouldn't get to, um, you know, power plants, um, processes and chemical types of industries and that sort of thing. And so we're really pushing the envelope there. And for even like a, something like autonomous driving, um, we're using the same architecture, control architecture that a lot of the autonomous car companies mm -hmm. are too, because it's really proven to be a smart thing. And because we have such a high critical, safety critical type of application, we're really trying to push the verification and validation procedures and, and methods that we're using for that. So that's my favorite. That's actually my PhD thesis was kind of in that vein. So that's, that's why, I, why I love this stuff. But from a different standpoint, I mean, we're pushing, we're pushing life support systems. We are pushing solar electric propulsion, like we're putting things out there in a totally different way. Um, We've got um, different types of power schemes and thermal processes and everything that we're pushing. So we're taking stuff that was, my favorite part about this is if you know we actually achieve this, we're taking stuff that was built in the 90s and launched into space and now we're updating it in 30 years and putting a whole new iteration out there. And that's pretty special to, to be able to push things further. 
you know, I'm starting to imagine how complex and automated your house must be. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> okay, so now, you know, so I do have to, I do have to, have to ask you this question though. So, what's your advice to young people uh, who want to be astronauts or want to go to space or you know want to get into some space industry when they go up? Uh, what do you say to them these days? Well, um, my advice has always been, and I got this advice when I was young, is you have to find something you're passionate about. Um, and space is great, but I'm talking about what's your niche? Like, what is it that you want to do with space exploration, technology, science, whatever it is, and become passionate about that. When you're passionate about it, you'll do well in it. And if you're doing well, you're going to get noticed and picked up by the astronaut corps or by NASA or what have what have you. But it really starts from you know you having a deep innate interest into what that is. Yeah, that's really cool. That's a, that's a great way to frame this for people who are thinking about this. You know, we all I, I certainly do run into uh, people all the time who say they you know they want to work for NASA or they want to work in space. But to be able to identify a, a niche that they really want to get into where they have. And the passion, like you said, Julie, is so important to have a passion about something. And if you're good, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll find your way into what it is you want to do. That's very mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I could talk to you all day about this stuff, Julia, but um, it's time for us to do some Q&A with the audience and uh, see what questions they may have. So uh, I'm looking for questions, folks, if you have anything. Uh, let's let's do that. I think I have one here already. Let's see if this is correct. Have you seen the newly released show on Netflix? And if so, what are your thoughts about the show and the science that's included in that? Have you seen that, Julia? Is it was it called the show? The show is called Away. Oh no, I am. You know, it's baseball season, and so uh -huh. that's what I've been doing. <laughs> No, I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. That's fine. Uh, I haven't seen it either, so it seems like we have some stuff to catch up on. Uh, so I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another question. Do you collaborate with teams in other countries on lunar technology? We do collaborate um, with folks um, in other, on other countries. So we've got um, some great collaborations with our European um uh, partners and then Canadian as well, as well as JAXA. So we've, and each of them, I, I love it because um, you'll see that different countries focus their technology developments kind of in different ways and, and you'll see them uh, excel in different places. You know, um, for example, Canada and JAXA are both very interested in robotics. Um, ESA is somewhat less so, but they are very interested in, in other things that are very important um, as well, right? So they, they definitely have their kind of their different strengths and weaknesses. And so I think that it's really nice to have um, an inter international collaboration on our spacecraft because we do get the best of what everyone has to offer. Um, and from my perspective, the, the vehicle system manager, you know, we have open um, reviews across all of our partners all the time, and, and they they constantly bring up you know great points and places to look and, and different um, things to explore. So it's a it's a really nice um, benefit. I guess uh, I guess. I guess you could argue in some ways that that is a benefit of diversity. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. broad perspectives and um, folks from other places bringing other ideas that can add to the program. Um, let's see, I have another question here for you. Um, what, are the, what are some of the challenges, Julia, about having a space station orbiting the moon? I mean, is there any... I guess challenges might be the best way to say it. Are there any detriments to having a space station or orbiting the moon? I think challenges is probably more like it. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely challenges, right? Um, we're gonna learn a lot just having it there for a long period of time. Um, one thing is that we've got a pretty good characterization of the uh, radiation environment around low Earth orbit, right? ISS has been there for many years. Um, we had space shuttle before that even, so we kind of get that. We haven't had things out very much further than 
that, um, we had a few Apollo missions and we were real lucky not to get any solar events <laughs> during yes. those Apollo missions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and right. so there's a lot to learn about. Now we've got a station out there for long term. It is going to experience solar events. And if people might be there during that time if we want a sustainable, sustainable effort, right? So how do we deal with that? Um, so there's a lot of things that go in that. Another thing is logistics. We, when we have the ISS, it's it's not like cheap, but it doesn't cost nearly as much to send supplies up to the ISS than it will to send it out to Gateway. And so hmm. one of the, the cool uh, parts that's going to be on Gateway is that um, on ISS, we found that we lost stuff every once in a while. Like there was just things that we thought we had up there that may have gotten trashed accidentally or whatever else, right? It's just hard to keep track of everything. You see the bags of stuff, right? And they're usually not lost. They're usually just not where you expected to find it. So what we're doing this time is we've developed a few pieces of technology for ISS. There's like an RFID tracking system that that's going to be implemented from the start on gateway right and so we're going to have inventory management it's going to be automated we're going to make sure that all of this is like in the right spot because we really can't tolerate any of the well i can send up something else on the next one because you know i can get that in there we really have to be a lot more um cognizant of all of the pieces of of, of anything of the tools or whatever we have um not that we're not on iss it's just one of those challenges where you didn't realize that you know, once you get that taken away, it's one of those things where you're like, okay, I need a solution for that. And so we're starting off with that solution, which is really exciting. Oh yeah, that is really exciting. Yeah, you know, I never thought about that as a as a as something that you have to think about. But yeah, you're right. It costs money to launch stuff, and um, you can't afford to keep losing things or misplacing them. So yeah, mm -hmm. I can really do that. I think I could use a system like that around my house just to help me keep track of where my glasses are. We all could. It would be great. <laughs> and that certainly is another aspect I'll ask you to talk about for just a half a second. You know, you mentioned a little bit about it before, but, you know, the technology transfer from all these, you know, newly developed technologies for Artemis, you know, they, they eventually will reflect back down here on the Earth. Oh yeah, and it might be faster than you think. I mean, if you think about the Apollo program, I think that's when we got ballpoint pens, right? I mean, it's it's crazy little stuff even that, um, that we might need a solution for, for something that gets exaggerated by the circumstance of space, but it, it really brings uh, stuff back home. ISS, I know you just said a half a second, but ISS has a whole page of the tech transfer that they've been able to achieve in the you know 20 years that or so that uh, ISS has been up there. And it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I, would, I, I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I always, you know, I remember, I remember uh, NASA used to have a publication called Spinoffs back before the internet, mm -hmm. you know, they were publishing yeah. stuff. And I, I used to get that, I think I got that like every six months or every year or so, uh, from, you know, mail or a thing or whatever. Uh, they used to mail stuff out, and you could look through and just find all these really cool technologies that had come out of it that uh, you know you could actually see around your house. Uh, let's see, I got another question here. Oh, here here's an interesting one. Uh, you know, feel free to decline this if you want. What's the difference in objectives between NASA and the Space Force? So NASA is completely civilian. We have no, our objective is for um, the space exploration and for education on the Earth. So we're supposed to help space and Earth and, um, and do those sorts of uh, research and, and um, development types of things. Not just space, obviously, NASA also does aeronautics. And so we do aeronautics research and we work closely with the Air Force, you know, for example, um, where uh, one of our bases is on an Air Force base, right? So that or actually maybe more than one of ours. And so we work closely with them too. Space Force, from what I understand, is more the military um, kind of side of space, which is also really important, has not ever been our charter. So it's it's a, a completely separate, I'm sure we'll end up working with them, but they have different objectives to um, protect space, um, whereas we are exploring it. Okay, great. So um, I know I mentioned a little bit about this before when I mentioned iRobot. I'm sure there's a lot more than that. But here's the question. Was there something in particular that exposed you to the path you took? 
So, yeah, and, it, and you know, again, we'll go back to that art inspiring, you know, life and et cetera and so forth. And I, when I was in um, seventh grade, I saw the movie of Apollo 13. And I thought that was just really cool. And actually, I wanted to be one of the ground controllers at that point. Like, this is neat that you got to do this. I never had any engineering in my family. So, like, it was kind of new to me, even like what an engineer would do and, and that sort of thing. And so it was a really cool thing to, to look at that. So that sent me down the space path that it made my, my space bug get activated. Um, and then when I was a little bit older than that, um, I read Isaac Asimov's iRobot and uh, thought, you know, robots are really cool. So let's, let's think about this. And so from that point on, essentially, you know, I did whatever I could to do, you know, like space camps or build robots for you know, different programs and whatsoever, you know, and at Purdue, I got involved with first robotics, I'm mentoring a high school team and um, just moved up on my education from there. And so that's, that's how I, that's how I ended up here. Very cool. Ended up in a great place. I got uh, just a couple of questions left here. Um, uh, let me ask you this one. Uh, so Artemis program, moon and Mars, uh, that's going to happen in the next 20 years, more than likely for sure. What do you see beyond that 50 years out, a hundred years out for space exploration, for human space exploration? Well, um, I hope that we can figure out a way to look beyond our solar system. Our solar system is kind of one way that a star plus planets could form, but that we found through visual exploration that there's a lot of different ways that that can happen. You can get your brown giants close in, et cetera, and so forth. So I think there's a lot more to, to look at out there. And there's only one planet in the habitable zone here, right, in our solar system. It's just us. Um, so Mars is a little too far away, so it's it's not quite there anymore. Um, but there are plenty of them, you know, the Trappist system, all these other places that that have that. Um, there are folks who are working on maybe not people necessarily, but how do we send things that can send data back to us? Um, and that will take time. Um, and so as we move toward that 50 year mark, I hope we have that figured out and we're really starting to, to explore those other solar systems um, as well. Uh, just a couple more. Um, coming up for uh, 2024 with uh, Gateway in place, when astronauts begin to go down to the surface of the moon, is there a plan that some kind of base is set up there on the moon that astronauts can go back to over and over again? And would that base be then uh, manned by, not manned, would that base then be crewed by uh, robots in the interim period uh, between human visitors? Yes, I don't think we're going to have that by 2024, but I think in 2026-ish time frame, that's exactly what we're looking for, is, is to have more of a sustainable base that we build up over time, um, that will have our robots and rovers and the different types of things that, that astronauts will need when they get there. Um, and so it sounds like even like you know, sample return and more robotic types of agents. Um, a gateway is meant to be able to deal with all of them. So that's uh, definitely in the in the plan. Cool. And uh, here's the last one for you, Julia. Uh, once we get out to the moon and, you know, we spend some time there, how long do you think it'll be between when we've sort of gotten ourselves well established on the moon that we'll be heading out to Mars? Yeah, you know, that's so beyond a technical question. <laughs> it ends up touching all the other things too. I hope that it's not too long. So if I was to only answer it from a technical perspective, I think that we would probably spend between uh, 10 and 15 years really understanding and exploring the moon and developing that, that Martian technology to really get there. So it would be about a 15 to 20 year difference just to you know kind of get that mission established and, and to go from a standpoint of our current budget and rate type of thing right so i think that there's definitely some some knobs to turn but uh definitely within um within a, a we might be old but our lifetime so, <laughs> cool. so yeah okay. all right and and i know the hosts are going to kill me but i have my one last little question i'm going to ask here if there was one technology that you would like to see implemented on the moon, like 
in your wildest dream, what would be what that what would that technology be? Oh my goodness, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that it would be really cool if we could like avatar robots around ourselves. Like we could just have our own little like swarm of robots, and we could be like, go explore this, and the whole thing would go and and just do it. And yeah, that would be really cool to be able to kind of have that personal robot experience. That would be neat. Sounds great to me. It all sounds good. <laughs> it all sounds really wonderful to me. Uh, so Julia, I, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Julia Badger uh, works for NASA. She is working on the Gateway Project currently, and I'm not going to get the title right. Julia, say it for me one more time. The Gateway Vehicle Systems Manager Systems manager. <laughs> and uh, you're making sure that all this stuff gets integrated in a way that it can come, it, it can get to work together, work on time. And this is a really critical program because Gateway is going to be that way station between International Space Station and the moon. Astronauts are going to hang out there before they go down to the surface of the moon, come back there before they head back to uh, International Space Station, and also be critical components in the Artemis program in which we eventually not only return people to the moon, but we build up uh, the skills and uh, technology we need to head out to Mars. So, uh, Julia, you're right on the cutting edge of things. Uh, it's really exciting to talk to you about this stuff. I'm glad you love your work. Uh, it's all really interesting. I'd love to have a chance to talk with you more about what you're doing as things go forward into the future. I hope you won't mind if I reach out to you and ask you to tell us more about what's happening uh, a year or so down the road. Not at all. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Derek. Appreciate it. Yeah, good luck with everything. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, folks. Take care.